Um, so this is the last part into a series that we dedicated to the Nativity. Um, I want to give some background before I start. Um, so the idea behind this series was that we would delve into the story of the Nativity a bit more uh, than we're used to, and we'd focus on the three main characters of the Nativity. Um, and so I started on uh, two weeks ago when I talked about St. Mary, which is a relatively easy talk to give, right? Like St. Mary, you know what you're going to say about her. You know what we believe about her. Um, it wasn't it wasn't too hard to do. And then last week uh, we talked about Saint Joseph, um, which I wouldn't do a great job on. It's, it's someone that we never really talk about. Saint Joseph is a, is a character that we don't really mention a lot about. We don't really know much about him, um, and we don't really talk about him in the church. So to prepare a talk from the things that we do know about him, it was it was sort of you know what you're going to say, yeah. Um, and so in my mind when I planned the series. I had planned for this week to be about Christ, and I sat and I asked myself, what the heck do I say about Christ, right? I mean, I could, I could take this so many different directions, um, I can go so many different ways, and most of the time preparing for this talk was preparing what in the world to talk about. Um, and so that very much influenced um, how this talk basically was prepared, because um, I didn't know where to go. I mean, do I talk about Christ's child um, and all the things that led up to his birth? Do I talk about the prophecies of the Old Testament and how they basically pointed all toward Christ? Uh, do I talk about how he was perfectly God and perfectly man and the perfect person to redeem us? Do I talk about how his incarnation fulfills, is fulfilled in his crucifixion, his resurrection? There's a myriad of, of topics, yeah? So what I did to try to solve my conundrum, this is an issue, what I did to solve my conundrum was I simply read through the nativity accounts. Uh, I read through the nativity accounts, trying to find some sort of cohesive theme or something just sticking out to me. And thank God, something did stick out to me, but I hadn't really seen much in the story of the nativity beforehand. Um, and I thought that this would be a really good way for us to literally delve into the nativity, because what we'll be doing today is reading a lot of the story of the nativity together, um, and we'll find that these stories are sort of the gospel readings for the four weeks before Christmas during liturgy. Um, so we'll pick apart what's going on and we're, I hope that we can sort of pull out the theme that I was able to see when I was reading them all. Okay. Um, and so we'll learn hopefully about Christ through learning, through looking at a lot of the other characters and a lot of the other situations that were sort of surrounding the birth of um, and so the nativity accounts come from two main places. Um, one is the Gospel of St. Matthew, and one is the Gospel of St. Luke. The, the two, um, these two Gospels, basically their first chapter or two, um, are all about this early period in Christ's life, and right before it. So the Annunciation um, of Gabriel to St. Mary, uh, the foretelling of the birth of St. John the Baptist, the birth of John St. John the Baptist, and that whole story. Um, Herod and the children being killed and that whole thing. If you want to find them anywhere, it's in the Gospels of St. Matthew and St. Luke um, in the first two chapters. So what I want to do is go through sort of a lot of the interactions that happen before Christ is born um, and we'll see a trend. Let's just start. So the first, Zacharias and Archangel Gabriel, right? So we have Zacharias, uh, who we know is a priest, and he is in the altar, we'll read it, but he's in the altar, and he gets this vision of Archangel Gabriel, comes to him and tells him, dot, 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 you will have John the Baptist. Okay, let's read it. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the division of Ephraim. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren. They were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the all order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Okay, so we see this first instance of this first story. Uh, we have Zacharias doing his thing. God appears to him in, 
not in the form of the angel, but God sends his messenger, the angel, with a message for him, and his initial reaction is fear, right? He was troubled and fear fell upon him. Good. And what is the response right away? What is, what is the message that Gabriel has come to bring him? Before he talks about John the Baptist, he says, Do not be afraid, Zacharias. So the angel of the Lord said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias. So we have fear, and we have a message of, don't be afraid, of peace, he did say. So you have a message, so you have a reaction of fear, and a really quick response of, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Um, so, first story. We'll just leave it there. Um, we see that Gabriel appears, he's afraid, and do not be afraid. Good? Next one. We get St. Mary and Archangel Gabriel. So this is, St. Mary has been in the temple all her life, and now comes Archangel Gabriel to give her the Annunciation of the birth of Christ. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, again, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Again, her first initial thing is, she's afraid. First thing that happens, fear. And what is the first message that's given in the face of fear? Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Okay? So we have two separate stories that are all happening in this nativity scene um, that are sort of following the same pattern. Righteous person, and we'll see later, unrighteous person also. Uh, God is about to do something. Fear, and then sometimes we get a message of do not fear. And sometimes we don't. And we'll get to why later. The next one. John the Baptist now is born, right? Elizabeth got pregnant. Now it's been nine months. Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So it was on the eighth day, and customary this is when you would name the child and circumcise the child. So it was on the eighth day they, would, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father Zacharias. But his mother answered and said, No, he shall be called John. We didn't read it earlier, but Gabriel told him, You must name him John, right? And Zacharias didn't believe him, and the way the story goes is that because he didn't believe the angel, the angel told him what? You will be not able to speak until this thing is fulfilled. So his mother answered and said, No, he shall be called John. But they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs to his father, Zacharias, what he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, His name is John. So they all marveled. Immediately, Zacharias, his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed. And he spoke, praising God. Then fear, again, then fear, we don't really know why, but fear came on all those who dwelt around them. And all these sayings were discussed throughout all of the hill country of Judea. And all those who had heard them uh, kept them in their hearts, saying, What kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Okay, again, we have this, we have this pattern. And as I started reading the stories, and I sort of it kept like hitting me that there's this pattern of we got the people, God is doing something, and we have the reaction of fear. Some deal with it well, some deal with it not well. Here, they didn't deal with it very well. They were afraid. We don't really know why they were afraid, but they were afraid. Fear had consumed them because of this thing that God was doing through John. Another one, St. Joseph, an archangel. Um, this is now from Matthew. I think all of those were from Luke. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary had, uh, was betrothed to Joseph, uh, before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make an example of her, make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. 
But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid um, to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Over and over and over, I, I couldn't like ignore it. Again, we have, this, we have the person, we have God is doing something, and we have a reaction of fear. Again, sorry to get repetitive, but it, it, I, I just kept finding them. King Herod, <clears throat> now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, of Herod the king, behold, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, afraid, fearful, and all Jerusalem with him. Person, God is doing something, fear. <clears throat> Again, the shepherds. Now, they were in the very. Uh, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields. So this is after Jesus has been born. They're in the manger. They couldn't find the place. They gave birth, um, and now the shepherds are hanging out, taking care of the sheep. And this is where this scene picks up. Now, uh, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy, which is for you, which will be to all people. Again, people, God is doing something great, a reaction to fear. What's, what's the common theme that's happening here? The common theme, theme happening here, what clicked in my head after I kept, kept reading fear, right, is this title that we give to Christ, is, which is what I want to focus on today, which is that Christ is the king of, or the, or the prince of peace. Right? We have him called the king of peace, and we have the verse in Isaiah in chapter 6, I think, that calls him this mighty counselor who will become the prince of peace. Right? And we see that in his coming, in every instance where his coming is involved, every single person somehow reacted right away, whether righteous or not righteous, with fear. Right? What was the difference in those who remained fearful and those who didn't remain fearful? I want to hear your thoughts. So it says, Mary was fearful. And she got a message of, do not be afraid. We know Joseph was troubled, and he got a message of, do not be afraid. We know Herod heard from the wise men, and he was just afraid. We know the shepherds were afraid, and they got the message of, do not be afraid. I want your thoughts. seems like those who were willing to receive the plan of God's plan uh, were the ones who were willing to not be afraid, who were, who were open to dealing with this without fear. Good. What else? I see confused faces. Yeah. Why? I don't understand what you mean by people who stayed fearful and ones who didn't. Because to me, they all look like the same category of people who were afraid mm. of. And some of them got a message, do not be afraid, and some of them didn't. Okay. I want to know why.
So when it comes to us, so we meet now Christ, uh, the Prince of Peace, right? We meet Christ as Prince of Peace, who in his coming shatters people's perceptions of fear and of peace. Exactly what you're saying. In that we know, we know from how the story transpired, that some people dealt with this fear as awe and reverence, and some people dealt with this fear as anxiety or worry or actual fear, right? And when Christ comes into us and he makes himself present, right, as this new Prince of Peace who is coming, right, it's a chance for us to sit back and to ask ourselves how we deal with Christ coming as this new Prince of Peace, right? Do we deal with this Prince of Peace in a spirit of awe? Do we deal with this Prince of Peace in a spirit of anxiety, right? And what is Christ doing that he's doing, that he's bringing all of this fear and peace and anxiety and worry? He's taking people and he's bringing to them truth, right? And we see this in his messages in the gospel all the time in his preaching. So, it says, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, right? We find that he makes a stark comparison between the peace of the world and our hope in the world and our hope in him and our peace from him, right? And what we have going on in the world until Christ comes is what I like to call like an unrecognized state of fear and panic, right? The world seems normal, everything seems okay, right? And when Christ comes, he turns everything upside down. Why? Because he sheds, he sheds light in the areas that were all darkness before that. Again, he sheds light in the areas that were all darkness before this, right? Um, an example comes to my mind, and I use this example all the time, so forgive me if you've heard it before, um, but I think it'll explain this point a bit more. Um, the prodigal son, okay? Um, the story of the prodigal son is that he went and he spent all his money uh, and lived lavishly, right? And he left his father's house, he didn't want to be part of his father's house anymore, and he went and he spent and he spent and he lived wonderfully until what? The money ran out, right? And he went and he uh, was a servant and fed pigs and lived a miserable life, right? When he was, he had it really good in his father's house, but he left that identity, basically, and he went and he served pigs, right? And uh, a priest made a meditation on this idea and basically said, imagine for a second, right? We know that the story ends with him, with the, with the gospel says, coming to himself, right? He realizes the, the terrible like, life that he's living and the identity of being the son of the father that he had, that he forsook, right? Imagine for a second he didn't come to himself and he stayed in the pig pen, yeah? And he lived life in the pig pen and he made friends in the pig pen and then he married in the pig pen and had pig pen children who then went to pig pen schools, who then created pig pen entertainment and pig pen politics and pig pen whatever, right? Imagine and this was the world. And then someone eventually, after many generations, they stop remembering that there ever was anything outside of the pig pen, right? This is the same thing that I call unrecognized fear and unrecognized chaos, right? Because imagine that you see this, this lineage, basically, of people that belong to a rich father that have sold their identity for pig pen, right? And they've been in it for so long that they don't know anything outside of it, right? And so the state of the world, when Christ came, when he was born, was the state of living in the pig pen, right? The state of the world when Christ came was the state of being in the pig pen, of pig pen love and pig pen relationships and pig pen dealing with money and pig pen uh, empires and emperors and kings and governors and laws and, right? 
And when Christ comes, he comes as the person to the pig pen and says, do you not realize, not only is that, that there's a world out there, but that you belong to the king of that world, right? That you belong to something that's much bigger than this, yeah? And so, in the same way, imagine that the person who comes to this pig pen to tell the lineage of the prodigal son's kids that there's something outside, they have a choice to deal with that message in two ways. One, to have fear and to freak out and to not want anything outside of that pig pen, right? And to be comfortable and to be okay living in the filth. Or two, they could be afraid of this person who's coming, you can imagine the appearance, who's coming in clean clothes, who's coming with a very different smell, right? Who's coming in a very different appearance than what they're used to in this pig pen world, right? And the fear that they would have for that person is a very dignified fear, right? It's a reverent, awe-inspiring, like Sarah said, fear, right? And so I couldn't help but just keep seeing this theme of fear pop up when we looked at the different characters all surrounding this coming of Christ, right? And how it sort of leaves us with the message of when Christ comes for us, right? We're heading towards this manger on Christmas ourselves, and the church is preparing us through these hymns and these fasts and these readings and these tunes, right? The church is getting us ready for us to head to this manger, right? And what I want to sort of to leave with is when we get to that manger and we find Christ who wants to know the ins and outs of us, right? Who wants to shine light in the areas of us that are dark and hidden and we don't want to unravel or unveil, right? When we meet that Christ, what is our reaction to that Christ? Is it a reaction of fear like Herod who basically is like a middle schooler who won't be defeated and tries to send people to kill the Christ child, right? You have this old man going after a little kid, right? Or is our reaction like the Theotokos, or like Joseph, or like Zacharias, who, sure, they each had their own process of how they dealt with it, right? But they accepted this fear almost with joy, right? We know that the message that Gabriel brought to St. Mary was not an easy message, right? You will bear the Son of the Most High, even if you do not know a man, right? Imagine getting that message. But she, despite her fear and reverence and awe, took it in reverence and awe, right? She didn't just stop at fear. Yeah. Joseph, the same way. You will take care of this woman you're betrothed to, who has a child now, who's supposed to be a virgin. You will now take care of her. Sure, fear is there, but fear that led to awe and commitment and, and giving of themselves, sacrificing of themselves, right? The question falls back on us. When we meet this Christ child, either in the nativity season when we get to the manger on the seventh or in our daily spiritual life all year when we meet this christ child and and are exposed to the light and the truth that he brings into all the parts inside of me that are missing or that are misshapen or that are damaged what is my reaction is my reaction one of running and hiding or one of rejoicing and going through the painful process of that being afraid.
C.S. Lewis says he's not a tame lion, right? right. In, in the Narnia. And so I'm not safe like I would like to be, mm. but I am safe. Yeah. I'm as safe as it gets. Yeah, and I, and I think that we could, I think we could see this from the gospel accounts because the gospel accounts, the way we read them is that it's a paragraph, right? It's a paragraph, but that paragraph could convey like three years of stuff that happened, right? So like we could read Joseph like accepted and took care of Mary and of the child, right? And they went and they went to Egypt and they stayed for a few years and then they went to Nazareth and Galilee, right? And so we could come away with, oh, Joseph was so courageous, right? And he just accepted and wasn't fearful. But like, sure, in the, in the four or five year process, that is what Joseph was, right? But the day to day, along with yes, still being courageous, I mean, they're human, right? They're going through this battle of, you sure you got me? Like, you sure I'm taken care of, right? Um, I just talking about this. I know. Yeah. We try to teach our kids too that courage is enough in the absence of fear. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, that trusting God. Yeah. Yeah. And. This, this is a process that happens both internally and externally um, because we have instances like Joseph taking the mother and the child, right? That's a very external thing. He's trying to trust God and external things are going on. But then there's also the process of me and sitting with myself and sitting in the presence of Christ and sort of dealing with the things inside of me and having and having the reaction of, I'm afraid of what I found, and having the Spirit of God come to me and tell me, do not be afraid, right? Um, this, is, this is both a thing that happens outside of our circumstances in our life, and a very much thing that happens inside of our spiritual walk, yeah. And in, I mean, this is our process of the spiritual life, right? Our process of the spiritual life is to know God, that we may know ourselves, that we may know ourselves, that we may know God, right? And that we may find communion with him in that wrestling back and forth of that. And Christ says it. And Jesus said to those Jews who believed with him, who believed him, if you abide in my word and you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Right? You shall know the truth and you shall leave the big ten. Right? You should you won't be slaves to yourself, to your faults, to your holes anymore. Right? Why? Because this Prince of Peace comes and gives peace through light and truth. Light and truth. He exposes and he shows what is real versus what's not real. Right? He shows what's real versus what's not real. And so this common message of how are we going to deal with this fear of meeting God in what he's doing in me and around me. we we'll read from Ephesians. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has, walked, has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the son of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were once in darkness, but now you are the light, in light of the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the Spirit all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Right? So our, our life in Christ now becomes Christ shining light on us that I may know myself, right? And find out what isn't fitting into his image that he created me with, and for me to root that out, and to go through life doing the same thing of using light to lead my path. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. 
Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. This is, this is the message that, was, that, came, that was proclaimed to the people in the pig pen. Awake you who sleep, awake you who have been here for generations, right? <clears throat> arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So, as we head towards this manger uh, in a few weeks to meet Christ, um, we meet the one who is the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, right? We beheld his glory the same way that St. Mary beheld Gabriel, the same way that the shepherds beheld the myriad of angels in the sky, right? We behold his glory, and that glory is of the only begotten of the Father who is full of grace and truth. So we ask ourselves, what is our reaction to meeting that word become flesh? What is our reaction to dealing with that light that exposes, that searches, that delves into? Uh, do we become children of fear or children of peace? How, how do we deal with the fear that we 